Let's get this uh, party started. Uh, my name is Michael Fox. I'm the president of the St. Petersburg Democratic Club. For those who have not yet met me, and uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. The St. Pete Democratic Club uh, is very thankful that you have shown this evening. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the club, we um, meet at the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, our um, mission statement is quite simple, get Democrats elected. And uh, we have folks involved with the uh, organization who uh, play very active roles in campaigns, and we're quite proud of uh, the work that we do. And if uh, you have not come in contact with anyone with the organization before, please do grab me at some point. Or board members, please raise your hands. And officers, grab one of those people uh, before you leave tonight, and we'll be more than happy to, uh, to get you covered. Now, this is going to be a rather unique forum, uh, unique in that you'll notice that all of the candidates will not be here. Uh, as the St. Petersburg Democratic <laughs> Club, uh, we have chosen to focus on those candidates who already have shown uh, a greater propensity for naturally exuding the kinds of um, uh, beliefs and, uh, and, and uh, just vision that we have. Uh, so as a result, sort of like the St. Pete Times does when they endorse a candidate, we have endorsed tonight not a single candidate, but all of them that we're talking about this evening. And we simply ask that this evening uh, you listen closely, hit them up with hard questions. If you have any questions while this is going on, simply raise your hand and a volunteer will come around with a clipboard and a pen and a, um, and a card. And uh, we will do our best to get all of those. Uh, if we are not able to get to all of the questions, you still have the opportunity uh, during our mingling period. Uh, from about 8.15 tonight until 9 o'clock, you'll have the opportunity to actually do one-on-ones with these folks, and we, uh, we entice you to do so. Uh, we suggest you do so. Get to know these folks quite well. And the, um, the final goal for this evening is for this to be a productive endeavor for you in that you have learned about these candidates and you are comfortable conceivably with casting a ballot. And if indeed that is the case, then we want it also to be a productive evening for these candidates. Please do get involved with that campaign. If you can cut a check, cut a check. If you can knock on doors, please do. If you can host a house party, please do. So we just want this to be not only a wonderful educational experience for you, but likewise an opportunity for you to get connected to these campaigns. And that's how democracy really works, is if you are involved. So thank you so much for taking the step of coming this evening to be involved. And uh, hopefully you will uh, move on to the next step as well. And uh, without any further ado, then, we have a, a, a actually, I'd like to uh, do a couple of sh shout outs very quickly here. We have a couple of uh, luminaries. Uh, Mark Hennessy, the uh, chair of the Democratic Party, is here with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Dwight Dudley, ladies and gentlemen. Dwight Dudley. And thank you both gentlemen for taking time out of your busy days on this. We appreciate having you here. Positive energy. Uh, so we're first going to have some opening comments uh, about uh, why you're here this evening, because municipal elections are vital. And someone that can give us a little bit of input on just how vital they are, uh, Councilman Steve Cornell. Steve Cornell. I have, a, I have another, just so you know, I have another event, so I'm usually not this casual, but I wasn't going to throw a suit on for 10 minutes. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, though. I'm real excited uh, to see all these candidates. I think we have some fantastic candidates. It's important. It's very important. City elections are important. When I was first running, I uh, was told, walking down with my list, so I skipped a house, and everybody said, no, you need to go talk to her. She just got broken into. So I went and talked to her, and this lady tells me this horrific story. My keys were on the table. The guys came in. They took two $50,000 cars. They wrecked them, blah, blah, blah. We could have been killed. What if my teenage son had woken up? And so I looked at her, and I said, well, you know what, ma'am? That is a, a important story. I got to ask you though, why you don't vote? She goes, "What do you mean? I do vote." I said, "No, you're not on my list." You know? And she goes, "I do vote." I said, "Okay, every four years for president?" Yes. I said, "Okay, well, the president has nothing to do with the St. Pete Police Department, but the city council and the mayor complete have everything to do with this, with the with the St. Petersburg Police Department. I promise you, the the president has other things on his plate. You know, it's important." The budget matters. You know, what I want to, you know, our values are reflected in that budget. I believe that. You know, and I'll tell you some of my values as a Democrat. 
My value, one of my strongest values is that people should get paid a living wage for working. You know, that you sit and work and then have to have charity. And I believe in that. You know, so I've had an opportunity to work to get um, tuition reimbursement approved for employees. It hasn't been put in yet. We're having that. But it's budget time, and we're going to have that discussion again this year. But it was approved by council, so now i got to get the mayor to go ahead, now that the budget has gotten a little better, to go ahead and, and do that. And I believe he will. Um, there's a million dollars in new funding that's happened for youth because we have Democrats on that city council. That's important. New funding. <laughs> EMS is a big issue. I don't hear hardly anyone bringing that issue up. It's not a hot button one, apparently, to the public. Uh, there is one that's very hot button. But EMS is life and death, folks. That is life and death. A lot of people, not everything is life and death. The EMS is life and death. You need, we need to talk about that. Um, I'll say this. If you think that, um, that if you're a one-issue person or you see candidates that are one-issue candidates, you need to think about that because you don't get to sit in this position. I can just tell you, and Renee can tell you, and, and anybody, Dwight, Representative Dudley can tell you. Um, you don't sit in a position like we sit in and focus on one issue alone. You have to deal with a lot of issues, uh, whether you like it or not. They're coming at you. And you have to deal with a variety of issues. So I think people need to have a platform that stresses a lot of different things. Um, I'll give you one other example. If you have kids from, and I'm not judging this, I'm just telling you a fact about this. From 2001 to about 2008, the prices for our play camps doubled. If you have now, if you don't have kids, that that may not you may not have noticed that. But if you have children, and then if you have if you see children, if you look in some of our more economically depressed neighborhoods, you see kids running around in the street after school. While we've doubled those those play camp fees over a seven to eight year period, that's an important thing. That matters. That matters a lot. Um, local issues matter. Um, you know, you're you're not likely to. Uh, call up the White House and get a conversation with President Obama, you're very likely uh, to get a conversation with your city council member. And you should do that. You should take advantage of that. Um, it matters, though. And I, I, I will close with this. I'm astounded. Um, you know, this is a democracy that we live in. 14% turnout. And I know I'm saying this to the wrong crowd, but maybe you can tell your friends. Maybe you can tell your neighbors. 14% turnout. I'm sorry. That is a terrible number. It's embarrassing. It's wrong. And people say, well, it's your fault because you guys are all bad and so there's no, nothing I do makes a difference. Well, that's just not true. You make a difference when you speak out. And there's, uh, there's a whole host of issues. If you doubt that, you can talk to me. I'll, I'll tell you that when you speak out, you make a difference. When people vote, if 50% or 60% or 70% voter turnout happened and people spoke on certain issues, those issues would come to pass in the city. Um, so, so vote. Do it. It matters. Encourage other people to vote. But don't take that. That's the easiest thing to do is to kick back and say, oh, I'm not going to vote because, you know, nothing matters. Everybody's bad. Nobody ever listens to me. <coughs> I'm going to challenge you on that. What have you done then? What have you done to make things better? Because this is a democracy. This is not about electing somebody and they control everything and they just do everything. It's about doing it as a, as a group. It's about doing it as a team. It's about participating and being part of it. And, you know, I'll just tell you, I can, I can think of a lot of issues where people have spoken up and made a huge difference, uh, a, whole, a whole host of issues. So please don't let people get into that attitude and vote. And uh, with no further ado, I'm going to turn it on to the next person so we can get these candidates. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, now, one of our uh, school board members we are quite proud to bring up to the stage here, Renee Flowers, is going to give us uh, a little bit of input and insight on uh, just how school board and municipalities uh, can work together to ensure that our children are succeeding. Renee Flowers, ladies and gentlemen. I think you all can hear me without a microphone, and I do a little bit better when I walk and talk. I'm a walk, talk, hands girl. My name is Renee Flowers, for those of you who don't know me, and I've had the privilege of serving in some very constructive capacities. I had the privilege of serving for eight years as a city council member in the city of St. Petersburg, representing 
portions of our community which are economically depressed. They were then and they still are now. I have the uh, wonderful opportunity right now to serve as a Pinellas County School Board member representing those very same communities. So I will tell you a little bit about what it is that municipalities and school boards can do together and have done together for the betterment of our entire community. Um, back in 2000, there was a meeting between City Council, Pinellas County Commissioners, and school board members about children. We had an increase in break-ins, we had an increase in auto thefts, and the whole conversation was around what can we do for children so that they have opportunities to do constructive things during those summer months and when they're out of school. And I will admit that I was one of those persons that said, well, that's not my area. I'm a city council member. That's the school board's problem. But I was so wrong because it is all of our problem. It doesn't matter where you serve. It doesn't matter if you're currently working, and it really doesn't even matter if you have children or grandchildren. What matters is those individuals are part of your community. And if we're not providing services for them, then they will be the people breaking into your cars, breaking into your homes, and doing things that help to further depress our community and its outlook. As a result of that, Larry Williams moved it forward that we would take a certain amount of dollars <coughs> from a fund that we had from a lawsuit we won, which we still use to this very day, where only the interest and not the principal is touched for programs and projects, as long as 10 years of maintenance is a part of that. And that's how we were able to expand and help reduce the cost for summer camps. That's how we were able to build the pool that I wanted in Child's Park, because I said it was not safe for children to walk from the Child's Park community to Jenny Hall Pool and cross that many streets unsafely. That is how we were able to increase and enhance the services that TASCO provides to children in the community. That's how we were able to do some upgrades with a relationship between public private ventures, JWB, and the city of St. Pete at Child's Park when Steve Cornell was over Child's Park and he did an absolutely wonderful job bringing in programs like string instruments, karate, and after school tutorial programs that I was able to bring in through the Coalition for a Safe and Drug Free St. Pete, where we not only mentored and worked with the youth, but we gave their parents an opportunity to come in so that we could conversate with them, and we were able to determine that many of them were illiterate themselves. So there's nothing better than working with the child in one arena and working with the parents so that they still have a sense of pride and they can learn along with their child. Currently, we have the Mayor's Mentor and More program. We have 5,000 role models that expanded from 500. That focuses on young African-American males, which we know 37% of those individuals are not graduating with a high school diploma. And I can tell you that as I took the stage from June 4th through June 8th for various high school graduations, there were a lot of children that walked across the stage but about 12% of those received a certificate of attendance. That means they went to school for 12 years. Several of them because they did not pass the FCAT. Others because they just didn't put the work in. They didn't put the time in. So what is it that we can continue to do in working together? And I know that many council members would speak the same. We have got to make sure that we don't just say that children are our future. We've got to put the money where our mouth is and show that children are our future. <laughs> One of the platforms I campaigned on was I think we need to bring back summer school. It is absolutely ridiculous to see that a child has needs and then we don't provide for those needs and we expect them to have a year and a half worth of learning in only 11 months. Well, I was delighted, but a little sad that Dr. Greco gets to take the credit for it, but we have Summer Bridge. We have over 6,600 students in Summer Bridge who failed the FCAT scoring a one or two so that we can give them that intense learning that they need. The Tampa Bay Times has followed 
around those various programs, seeing exactly what's happening. And I can assure you, it is not babysitting service. It's making sure that they bring up those reading scores, math scores, and science. We've got to prepare them for the end of course exams as it relates to algebra. How can you do algebra if you can't even complete basic math? Mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to go to boot camp Common Core for four hours. I passed the test, but I will tell you, I did not do as well as I thought I should have. So I know it is a challenge yet ahead for our children. We put $3.75 billion into that program. We put our money where our mouth is. We are so happy that the state legislature provided an opportunity for dialogue and discussion for racist <coughs> teachers. I will never get to say too much, and you will never hear me say this again, but I am happy that Governor Scott offered up the money. But through the dialogue and discussion between the House and the Senate, it went from just teachers getting the raise to expanding that ground to vice principals and principals, guidance counselors, and other persons who touch students. So while it is true that Pinellas County got 4% of the total realm of money, we now have a greater number of people we have to provide that to. We are in negotiations with the teachers union. The numbers look real good as it relates to what we'll be able to give them. But it's not enough because teachers need to be paid like doctors and lawyers because they help fix our children. <laughs> Mike is telling me I gotta sit down. Mike is telling me I gotta sit down, but what I will say to the individuals behind me, whoever wins this election, you can't do everything but be good at what you do. Keep your promise to the community and to our children that you'll do the very best that you can. Thank you. Uh, I now want to hand this, uh, this soiree over to our moderator for the evening, Phil Payton. At any rate, my name is Phil Payton. I'm in the St. Pete Democrat Club, and I'm your moderator for this evening. I want to welcome you guys all here to the Sunshine Center tonight. It's a pretty informal forum. Um, first off, we're going to introduce the uh, districts who don't have any representation here tonight. And uh, that's District 2, which has Democratic opponents, uh, Jim Kennedy, rather candidates, Jim Kennedy and Lorraine Margison. Both of them were invited to be here, and neither one of them could make it tonight. District 6 has one Democrat running, and that's uh, incumbent Carl Nurse. Um, Councilman Nurse also could not make it tonight. For District 4, we do have one Democratic candidate here tonight, and that's Darden Rice. And if she would like to come up, uh, we'll give her five minutes to um, talk about her campaign. Darden Rice. Thank you, Phil. Good evening, Democrats. This is a great looking crowd tonight. My name is Darden Rice, and I'm running for St. Pete City Council District 4. I'm the only Democrat in my race. And I don't think I heard um, anybody comment on this so far, but you guys know how the, how the city council races run. The, the top two, the, the, the primaries are district only, and then the top two vote getters proceed to a citywide election. So for those of you here tonight that don't live in District 4, in my district, um, you can vote for me in the general. So on uh, August 27th, you can vote for your choice of mayor, you can vote for your choice of the district you live in, and you can vote in the referendum. Um, in the general election, you, vote, you can vote for all races, mayor and 2, 4, 6, and 8, and that will be November 5th. So just a, a little bit of voter education. Sorry, I'm a former president of the League of Women Voters. It's just a habit. Um, a lot of you guys know me pretty well. I have deep family roots in this area. Um, I've lived in St. Petersburg over 20 years, 16 of which as a homeowner. Um, my mom is a native Floridian. Uh, she was a seventh generation Floridian from the Pompano Beach area. Uh, my father, uh, his side of the family, came down to Pinellas County from Virginia in the 1950s. And I just wanted to say something uh, personal. You know, I first started getting involved in politics when uh, my mom, uh, kind of getting over a divorce, my mom took me to the Democratic Party headquarters to volunteer, and she took me with her. And I got to see my mom kind of come to life again as she got involved with people and got more involved with the community. And growing up in North Carolina, and my mom was an artist by trade and an activist by heart. 
And uh, growing up in North Carolina, we basically campaigned against anybody that ran against Jesse Helms. And I'm sure you guys remember Jesse Helms. He's sort of like anti-gay, anti-woman, anti-immigrant, anti-everything. So if having a mother like mine and a senator like Jesse Helms doesn't politicize you at a young age, I really don't know what will. Um, and I'm really proud to say that um, I have my 14-year-old nephew here with me this summer. Uh, he maybe made the mistake of mentioning he was interested in politics. So uh, Gabe, raise your hand. He's sitting in the back there. He's helping out with the campaign. If anybody wants any extra campaign material or an envelope, uh, Gabe is here. And Jenna, our volunteer coordinator, is in the back also. Um, a lot of you guys know I've been working in our community for a long time. I'm an Eckerd College graduate. Um, I was president of our local League of Women Voters for three years. Um, I was on the Charter Review Committee, and in that role I served as chair on the Waterfront Committee. And also importantly, I serve on the PSTA board, and I'm passionate about transportation. There's no one else in my race who is more knowledgeable, more committed, or more forward-thinking on transportation issues than I am. I will tell you that transportation is so important because from transportation flows all of the big ticket important items that city council members and all elected officials need to be looking at. And it's connected to jobs, to growth, to housing, to uh, clean air, clean water, reducing our dependency on oil, infrastructure. It's really getting us ready for the future and I'm absolutely committed to this issue. I bring to you over an experience, uh, over a decade of experience working on public interest issues, from access to affordable and quality health care, to working on environmental issues, taking the bias out of medicine, voting rights, and clean energy. So these aren't just talking points to me, these are issues I've worked on for years. I bring a great deal of experience and knowledge on these important public interest issues. Um, in my race, uh, the current incumbent is term limited out, so I'm running for an open seat. And so I'm running on my platform, which is called St. Pete Strong. And St. Pete Strong focuses on three things. It focuses on jobs in the economy, focuses on strong neighborhoods, and it focuses on strong city services. You can find out a lot more about my platform and where I stand on the issues at my website, which is votedardenrice.com. Uh, my main opponent in this race, the one who is picking up the most uh, financial support and media attention, is someone that you all have probably heard of as well. My opponent is a Tea Party extremist by the name of David McCaleb, who is... Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Renee. Um, so we are, to win this race, it's all about turnout, it's all about getting uh, the Democrats, it's about getting the common sense crowd activated, engaged, in voting on August 27th and again November 5th. So thank you so much. Uh, I know I have the support of you guys in this room. I'm going to need your help with volunteering. Uh, Jenna is helping us run three phone banks a week for my house. We are doing canvases during the week and big canvases on Sundays. Uh, it's really easy to get signed up and get involved and request a yard sign. And our credo is if we're not having if we're not having fun, we're not doing it right. So join us, volunteer, and let's win this. I just want to do a quick reminder before we get into the District 8 candidates, please silence your cell phones if you've not done so already. Please do that. Thank you. All right. District 8 has four Democratic candidates, and they're all up on stage tonight. I'm going to introduce them, and then I will allow each of them to come up individually, give a five-minute opening remark, and then we'll get into the questions and answers. So we have Alex Densing, we have Robert Davis, Amy Foster, and Steve Galvin. Alex, if you'd like to come up and give your opening remarks, five minutes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Hi, I'm Alex Dunsing, and I'm running for city council on District 8. And I'd just like to kind of introduce you to, uh, to myself and to my campaign by talking a little bit about my work as a college professor and the kinds of things that I, I did over at SBC and at USF. Um, when I was a college professor, I, I, first of all, in the classroom, I was very good at bringing people from all different kinds of backgrounds together to listen.
listen to each other, to learn from each other, to create to get together. Um, and that was a very important thing, and I, it's one of the things that I'd really like to do for St. Pete. The other thing that I did, and I'd like to really work to do this for, 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 for all of you, is to listen to each and every one of you, to know what your concerns are, to know what your, what your, what your problems are. Um, I, students would come up to me, and they would say, well, I'm, I'm, having, I'm having problems writing a resume. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, write a, I'll help you write a resume. Come on, come on over, let's, let's do that. Um, someone else would say, I'm having problems with financial aid. Well, one of the things I would, I would do with those students is like, don't worry, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a professor here. Let's walk over to financial aid. I'll, I'll walk them over there and say, hi, I'm Alex Dunsing, a, a professor. Um, I hope when I, when, I, when I become elected to city council, I hope to be able to do that for the people of St. Pete. To, when they're having problems and they, when they need someone on their side, I hope to be able to say, hi, I'm Alex Dunsing, I'm, I'm a city councilman, and I'd like you to help my, my, my friend right here. That's what I want to do for each and every one of you. Um, my, my approach um, to, run, uh, to running for office is to walk a beat, and which is something that I uh, intend to do as I, as I continue um, uh, as a city council person. I want to, um, I've been knocking on doors. I was like, what's, what's important to you? Let's have the big discussions. What's, what's, what are your needs? Today I spoke, to, I went over to the uh, 49th Street pub, and they're like, well, I was like, do you have a Facebook page? He's like, no. I was like, okay, I'll come over here that um, Friday, and we'll, we'll make you a Facebook page. Um, uh, the, other, the, the other day, I was, uh, I was talking to the people over at SUAC. Um, they're like, we need, we need waste wood. Uh, one of one of the one of the, uh, businesses here, Premium Leisure, uh, uh, Premium Leisure, they, they have tons of waste wood. So I partnered uh, the, the waste wood with with Suac. Um, so that, that's the kind of thing I want. I'm going to do is I'm going to go walk around, listen to what you need, listen to what your um, what your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations are, and connect them with others. Um, I'd like to all, lastly invite you all to a. Um, I'm having a big event. Um, we're bringing together local community, um, local artists. Local business, local food. It's um, this Saturday at uh, seven, seven till seven, seven o'clock till late. Come and come and experience it. It's, it's a lot of what I've done has brought a lot of people together from all walks of life. Because there's, tell me if I'm wrong. Is, is Saint Pete? Is it just me or is, is Saint Pete on the cusp of greatness? Like right. something, like something's really, really happening here, and I want to be the catalyst that, that brings it to the next level. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I'm Alex Dunsing for City Council, uh, District 8. Yeah. Our next candidate for City Council, District 8 is Robert Davis. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming here tonight and braving the weather we had. I was watching. We had three hours of rain pouring down. And it's great to see everybody excited here braving the, the elements. That'll turn a lot of people off, at, you know, coming to events. Do you believe um, that your city council member should have a vast amount of governmental experience and service within the neighborhood associations? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Do you believe, do you, um, are you excited like I am about the vibrancy of the downtown and would you like to see it spread out through the rest of the district? Do you like feeling safe in your neighborhood? Yes. One of those things I want to work on is um, I want to fight to protect that we uh, have the neighborhood community uh, police officer program. Because when I was neighborhood president over at Crescent Heights, we developed a relationship with our community police officer. And he was very helpful in having us solve a lot of the different problems within the neighborhood, things that you wouldn't even imagine. You know, like um, one of the motels had pedophiles that were congregating there, and he was able to allay our fears about it. And that was about when they started posting that sort of thing on the web. People were getting worried they were seeing it on the web. And he told us what he did, you know, what he would do with that situation. Later on, the city helped us out even more when they built a bank where that motel was. So we got rid of that motel. But rather serendipitously. But I worked a lot with the police, the community police officer, and he came to all of our meetings over at Crescent Heights. Um, I served on their board for three years before we later on we moved to the Central Oak Park neighborhood where my wife and I and kids now reside. 
The other thing that I want to work on, and I work, walk around my neighborhoods and I see a lot of vacant houses that have happened because I suppose a lot of people have been unemployed. I see a lot of people looking for work. And one of my central tenets is I'm going to work on it, getting a jobs program. I talked to Steve a little bit about it um, at one of our um, three budget meetings that we had, the budget summons, which I attended all three of those and spoke at each one of those. And one of the models I've been looking at really captured my interest was the Brooksfield one. It's Brooksfield, Florida. It was started with a Department of Labor grant. And what they did is they uh, took Department of Labor statistics and they figured out they needed 500 welders in the state of Florida. And they matched up. They found applicants to apply for the, um, the training that they were going to give. And they made agreements with those companies. And as soon as those applicants got the training that they needed, they got a job. I love that program. I wish it was there when I was in college because when I got my four-year degree at Drake University in political science, they said, here, here's a, an interview class. Here's how you do a resume. Good luck, you know. And that year back in 82, it was a really bad year as well for looking for work. I think there was four employers that came to our <laughs> campus that year. And Drake's kind of on the comparable with the Eckerd's College as far as tuitions go. It's a very very good private school with about 5,000 applicants. And I got my political science degree and I worked on my journalism and I was out looking for work like everybody else. So I would like to see a Brooksfield model because that's a direct influx of things. So I, I talked to the program manager over there and I go, how can we get something like that here? And I'm still working on the, uh, the nuts and bolts on that. When I do get some more information, I'll be willing to share it with Steve and other council members so we can get that program here. You know, I want to see 500 welders or CPL operators or cooking school or something. You know, there's, there's jobs to be had out here. We have lots of needs in this community. So those are the two big things that I'm working on already as your council member. Um, I, what sets me apart from the rest of my uh, opponents in the 8th District is I have a vast amount of government experience and I'll share with you a little bit about what I've been doing. For the last seven years, I've worked for the city of St. Petersburg at the library there. I'm also a union steward and a member of the SEIU um, union. Um, as a union steward, I've been working with um, employees, you know, work through some of their issues that they have that come up from time to time when you're working for a big city like ours. And uh, the other um, five years earlier, I was working for the uh, state of Florida at the health department in the uh, WIC program. And these are two very successful programs. They're very good models for what other programs could be doing because they do more with less. They get a lot done with very little resources. The WIC program is, of course, financed by the federal government, but it's a state's administrator. And it's a very good program. There's not a lot of... Um, red tape and paperwork you have to go through. And it's very proactive, like you know, Renee was talking about what we do for our children. That's a very good program because you, it helps with nutrition for pregnant moms and for children five years or younger. And you can um, apply for that program and you're, one of the things you show proof of the wages that you earn. And to me, that's a very good indicator of what your social economic you know, condition is. That should be it, right? You know, just, Show them what you're earning, and that kind of tells you what's going on, you know, at home and what you're able to provide your kids. And everybody, every parent wants to provide as much as they can for the kids. What this does is it front, lo front loads the problem because it makes sure those kids get proper nutrition so when they go to school, they're not hungry. If you look at United Nations studies, hungry kids don't learn as well, you know, as other ones because they need that food. They need a shelter. They need a place to live. Am I done? You're done. I already used five minutes? Oh. More than six. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for giving me that extra minute. I want to make sure you vote for Robert J. Davis on August 27th. If you have any questions, my campaign manager wife is in the back there, Joe, and she has some brochures if you'd like thank to you. volunteer for our effort. Thank, thank you. you. My name is Kay for City Council for District 8 is Amy Foster. So good evening. I'm Amy Foster and I'm running for City Council in District 8 because I love St. Petersburg and I have the skills we need to meet our city's goals. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself, but let's get one thing straight first. 
There may be one foster running um, this race that you might not be happy with, but I'm the foster that you should like. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about my background. Um, I currently work for a nonprofit where I manage 39 states. We build public-private partnerships for workforce development issues, and the issue that I'm focused on right now is to increase the number of girls in science, technology, engineering, and math. Prior to that, I worked for Girl Scouts of West Central Florida for 12 years, and um, I was the director of girl and adult leadership development there. All of my work in volunteerism has been focused on helping people and solving problems, and that's what I'll do as your next city council member. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've heard on the trail, and I'm sure that all of you are going to agree with this. One of the things I've heard from almost everybody is that we all want the same things. We want our family, friends, and neighbors to be healthy, happy, and successful. And I think there are three key issues for our city to help address that. One is building safer neighborhoods. Two is creating jobs and developing our workforce. And three is preparing our next generation of leaders. And tonight I'm going to focus on one of those issues. And I had no idea that Renee and Steve were going to talk about this tonight, but I'm glad that they did because I'm going to follow up on it. I've had one opponent um, it imply a little bit that city council doesn't really have anything to do with education. And so I want to talk about why education is important. It's not only uh, the right thing to do for our city, it's imperative. And if any of you attended the last mayor's forum, every single one of those candidates spoke about why education is important. Let's talk about if we don't have an educated workforce, we can't attract businesses to our city. If we do not have schools that are performing well, families will not see our city as a place to live. It is important for us to partner with our school board and our local industries, as Renee talked about. But more importantly, um, we have the control of the budget. And so some of those ways that I think city council can really have a huge impact is in out-of-school time opportunities. And so let's talk about that for a minute. Research shows that youth involved in out-of-school time opportunities are less likely to smoke, less likely to use drugs, less likely to have teen pregnancy, and more likely to have important role models in their life. Another thing that we know about youth involved in out-of-school time opportunities is that their achievement gap is lessened. One of the things that Renee talked about was the Summer Bridge Program. Underrepresented youth have a wider achievement gap that is lessened when they have opportunities for summer internship programs, summer employment programs, and summer camp opportunities. And I think this is key to solving many of the problems that we see in our city. And I think we've got to get this right. Um, we were asked to address four questions tonight, so I'm going to quickly do that. The first question was the peer. Um, let's be real clear. The voters don't want politicians making that decision for them. So let's let the voters vote. I personally will be voting no on the referendum, but that's not what's important. What's important is that the voters will have their vote and then hopefully we'll move forward together because there are lots of important issues facing our city. The second question was about the raise. The Rays have a contract. A lot of people made sacrifices for that stadium to be built. Let's have them honor that contract and hopefully transit will be a game changer. The third question was what efficiencies do you think we can accomplish in our city? I think technology and incorporating more of it is really important for creating city efficiencies. But one idea for streamlining that I would have is our billing and collection departments. We have six different departments. They're all doing the same function. Let's streamline that. And then lastly, the question was why you can and will win. I have one word for that. We've had more. Our message is resonating more with voters. We've had more events, more endorsements, more phone banks, and we have more volunteers to keep that momentum going, and I think it's likely that we have uh, more donors as well. So thank you. I'm Amy Foster. I'm asking for your vote on August 27th, and things are going to get better now because together we can make great things happen. Uh, candidate for City Council District 8 is Steve Galvin. Thanks for coming out. Great here tonight. My name is Steve Galvin. I'm running for the ever popular District 8 seat in City Council. 
And I believe that St. Petersburg is at a pivotal point in its history. And it's, it's time for us to make some, some hard decisions. And it's going to take a creative experience and leadership to move us forward in the right direction. And I am that candidate. This is my first time running. And, you know, in, in all of these forums, I hear the same things. Everybody wants less crime, jobs, and safe neighborhoods. Well, who doesn't? We all, that's, that's what being a community is. But I'm the only candidate who has experience in all of those areas. I've dealt with crime in my neighborhood. I've stopped burglaries in my neighborhood. I've been a victim of burglary. I've gone to court, and I've made sure these people went to jail. So I've dealt with crime. I've had drug dealers three doors down from me, openly dealing in the street. We put a stop to that. Jobs. I've been a small business owner my whole life. I'm the only one up here who's actually employed anyone. You know, that means paying them out of your own till from your business. So I understand what it takes to create jobs. I have a tremendous background in retail. Uh, one of my pet projects is 22nd Avenue North here in the district. Uh, I've been in contact. They've kind of cobbled together a coalition, uh, calling it Home Improvement Row. Uh, I want to get the city involved. I want to do there what we did in the Grand Central District and get a cohesive look, some signage, some uh, landscaping, and really create another, another zone in the city that's, this is where you go. If you're going to work on your house, you need any remodeling materials, this is the place to go. And I think that that identity should be clear. We got the, uh, the Brownfield designation there for the last lot across from Mazaros, and uh, that, there's a developer already in line ready to put businesses, he's already got businesses lined up to move in there. As far as the four questions go, it's amazing to me when I get out and I canvass the neighbors, how many people ask where I stand on the lens. Personally, I'd rather stand on the pier. You know, Rick Baker, he put that money together. And he put that money together to refurbish the pier, not to tear it down. So let's do that. There are plans in place, plans exist, to actually create a more modern version of what we have of the pier for it within the budget that we have to work with. I mean, some of the numbers that are being thrown out there are kind of ridiculous. They include, you know, in widening the approach to an additional another 50 feet wider than it already is, and there's no reason to do that. There's no reason the car should be parking on the approach. Uh, I could spend 20 minutes on the pier, but I'll move on. The raise. I agree with Amy. The deal is a deal. The city went to a tremendous expense and effort to create the raise in the first place. They built the stadium. Teams said they would come if we built the stadium, but they used that to leverage the towns that they were in to get them to build a new stadium there. We went to Major League Baseball. They said no. We sued Major League Baseball and finally got a team. So we own the Devil Rays. They have a contract till 27, and I believe that with the, the implementation of Greenlight Pinellas, and get our transportation system to be what it should be, including a light rail component to Tampa. I mean, wouldn't it be great to be able to take a train to the airport? We're one of the only metropolitan areas in the country where you can't take a train to the airport. And it's time to step up and be there. Inversely, Tampa fans will be able to get on that train and come to St. Petersburg, have a stop at the drop, and enjoy the game. So. My wife and I, we volunteered at the Tropicana for two seasons, and I'm telling you, it depends on the team. We've seen that place packed, and we've seen the place empty, and it boils down to one thing, and it's performance. And when the team is doing well, the people go. It's not the facility's fault. But I'd like to facilitate it, make, make it easier for people to get there via the Greenlight Pinellas plan, and uh, I think it's, it's a lot more efficient way to get people to and from the game. City services. Actually, I think the mayor's done a pretty good job of streamlining things in the last few years. Uh, nobody's had my, my wife's works for the city. She hasn't had a raise in five years. Uh, we've consolidated s uh, services. But one thing I would like to do is I've lived in a number of places in the country, and this is the only place I've ever lived where they pick up your trash twice a week. To me, that seems a little redundant. I, I, I would propose that we pick up trash once a week and do recycling the second time have the city get involved in the curbside recycling instead of outsourcing it to some other company. I mean, it, it, it's to me, that's just sort of a no-brainer. And as far as my campaign is concerned, 
I have a professional experience manager consultant with a with a track record of winning municipal elections. I've got some great volunteers from age 19 to 90 that will work in my campaign. But the most important reason why my campaign will succeed is that we have the best candidate. So I'd appreciate your support and your vote. Steve Galvin, City Council District 8. Thank you very much for your time. Now I'm going to read off some questions that were posed by you guys, the audience, and I'm going to ask the candidates, please keep it to one minute to be fair to everybody. Jesse is going to be the timekeeper, so he will hold up the phone. If you can't see it, he'll just wave you when you got about 10 seconds left, and uh, we'll go from there. It's not a chance to necessarily address another candidate one-on-one, -on -one, um, and we'll go from there, so we'll see how it goes. First question uh, for Mr. Dunsing. Again, this is from the crowd. Our city is currently moving towards two goals, profitability and sustainability. We see this trend with current proposals to alter our waste treatment infrastructure and generate compressed natural gas with biodigesters at waste facilities. That's a mouthful. Do you support renewable fuel production in St. Pete? And will you support future initiatives which focus on local energy production? What is Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that looks left me a, lot, a little extra time, but uh, <laughs> so I'll borrow from him. But uh, anyway, I believe in re renewable energy sources. I think we should be doing solar energy a lot bigger than we are too, making solar panels. I mean, I've lived in Germany, and they don't have near as much sun as we do, and they're doing way better than we are as far as solar panel production. So I think we should definitely get involved in that game. We are the sunshine state, right? Thank you. Do you support renewable fuel production in St. Pete, and will you support future initiatives which focus on local energy production? Yes, let's live up to being a green city. There you go. I think I'm going to have to say yes on this one, and uh, i got to agree with Robert on the solar. I mean, it's, it's really a sin that we as the Sunshine State aren't at the leading edge of solar implementation. Thanks. Our next question is kind of relevant at this point, and Mr. Davis, you'll get to go first. What would you do to reduce flooding in our streets? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that one, because uh, I work over at Main Library, and our parking lot floods a lot. So I would like us to do you know, better work with the sewer system. I know I understand we're just a little bit above sea level, so part of that problem is that we're just above the ocean. But I would like to see some, you know, work done in that area too. They did some work over at the library, but it kind of helps, you know, a little bit, but not a lot. So I'd like to see more done with that particular thing. I got a vested interest in that one, unless I have a boat to get out, you know. You're gonna need Thank one. you, Mr. Davis. <laughs> gonna need one if we have a, if we ever have a hurricane hit here too. That's gonna be a big problem. Miss Foster. Well, I'll be honest, this has not come up until Darden Rice actually brought it up this weekend. Um, there definitely is some drainage problems that have been noticed over the last week, and I'll have to do some more exploration around that, but I think with my collaboration skills, I'll work with the various city departments to uh, make that happen. Yeah, unless we have some way of elevating the city a little bit higher, I think we're going to have to deal with our drains. Um, and make sure that everything is kept clear and clean and uh, keep on it. Thank you, Mr. Robert. <coughs> Mr. Robert. Oh, hi. Um, I, I've, I've talked to one of my friends is in uh, water management, and it is, a, it is a big problem. We do have some very old infrastructure, and I can assure you that one of my first priorities is to make sure that the infrastructure that we have is strong, Moreover, to make sure that the people who run our infrastructure are well compensated, and I would like to say, equal work, equal pay. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Foster, you'll get to answer this one first. So much time, energy, and concern has been spent on the lens. Um, what would you do about these other issues, such as drugs, gangs, and the future of our youth and the safety of our citizens? <laughs> and world peace. Well, I 
think that I already addressed some of that. Um, my background's in youth development, and I think it's one of the most important things we can do. Um, certainly, we have to collaborate with the nonprofits that are already working to address these issues. We have to work with our businesses who have a vested interest in this. We have to work with our school board. Um, so I think that's an important part of it. I think it's also about working with our officers to uh, address the issues. But prevention is way more important than intervention. We can save dollars by preventing those issues in the first place. And those out-of-school time programs that I talked about earlier, we know that there are less public safety issues when youth are involved in those from 3 to 6 p.m. Yeah, to deal with our drug and crime issue, I mean, part of the element there is jobs. Um, it needs to be available to have, you know, an actual job and, and, and not a situation where it's easier to make a good living selling drugs than to go into a job. Uh, again, with the green light, Pinellas will enable people to have a wider uh, area to which for to look for employment. Um, I also agree that education is highly important. Uh, the unions have been putting together an apprenticeship program, uh, which I'm very excited about. I'm, I'm basically a product of that. I learned how to do many things when I was young. I learned how to weld in high school. I learned how to work uh, a metal lathe. I learned how to wire a home when I was in high school. And I think that having alternative education, I mean, not everybody's designed to go to college. It isn't right, always the right path for someone. And there's a lot of great occupations out there where you can make a, an excellent living um, as an electrician, as a plumber, as a machinist. Um, I think that we really need to look at some of our educational alternatives other than sending kids to college. Thanks. issues of drugs, gangs, and the future of our youth and the safety of our citizens. Okay, thank you. Um, as you know, I'm a big supporter of the community police uh, officer program in the cities, and that puts a face on, uh, on the um, law enforcement for the neighborhoods, and they work together with the community um, neighbor associations. Also, I'd like to see some more crime watch programs. I think those are really a big help, too. You get neighbors out there looking around and it, it helps put a, um, a stop to some illegal activities because they can call the, the uh, non-emergency number for the police department. Also, um, one of the things too is that uh, Steve mentioned about the um, you know career place uh, career uh, paths of our students. I, I'd like to see some more paths you know for them to, to operate on, like on um, doing trades as an option. You know, if you don't really feel like you're a four-year college student. You should have some trade options, too. I think we should be looking at those kind of things as ways to give our young more opportunities. Thank you. After 9-11, uh, uh, I was in New York, and I would volunteer taught at the High School of Economics and Finance. I was a, I was a poetry teacher. And the program coordinator came up to me one day and, and said, you know that, that that person was was in gangs and he was really rough. And I don't know what you did to him, but he's changed his life around. And I'll tell you what can change life around for people is one, um, the arts. We have a really strong arts community here, and I'll personally go around all throughout, as I have been, go throughout the town, um, and let people let people of all ages know that there are ways to to express yourselves positively with arts, with music, with poetry. Uh, the other thing is, is just once again to go around and letting people of all, of all kinds know that they're valued, that they're special. You are all special. I think just understanding that um, can change lives around. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Gavin, this is your question. What is your position on red light cameras? If you would get rid of them, where would you try to make up their portion of the $2.5 million budget for traffic and parking fines in one minute? Red light cameras, they get one of those hot button issues. Um, I think that the idea of red light cameras was probably not a bad one. I think the implementation has been an abysmal failure. Um, I think the inconsistencies in yellow light timing on some of these intersections, the, uh, the arbitrary 
right turn on red tickets, the burdensome appeals process and costly if, if you don't prevail. Um, it, it really has been very poorly implemented. The idea is a good one. I mean, it's a it, it's important that we keep intersections safe and people, I, I, you see people run red lights all the time in the city. But I believe that it, it is so, at this point, so stigmatized and uh, I think it's just, they just have to go away. Uh, I think with the red light cameras, I think that's a two-part problem. Uh, one, first of all, no one should be running red lights. I think we can all pretty much agree, except there are some, some times when, of course, um, the, the, you might be behind a truck. There, there are extenuating circumstances. I think what's the problem is, is largely to do with the judicial end, the appeals part of the, the red light camera issue. Um, you have to pay extra fines to, to, if you try to appeal them and lose, you, you can get points on your license um, if you um, lose. So I think that the, the appeals process needs to be made fair. Um, and we do really need to look very closely at to, um, making sure that the sequences of all lights are the same, that the yellow, lights, uh, the yellow light times are, are proper. Um, I would personally vote uh, as it stands to get rid of the, the, the contract because as it stands, I, uh, I don't think it's making the road safer. And um, particularly from, um, I spoke to a motorcyclist the other day, and if you're on a motorcycle and you have to stop short and someone runs into you, that, that could be the end of you. So I, I, I'm very hesitant on that. Thank you. Mr. Davis. I wish I had more than a minute to talk about this one because I've been looking into this issue. And it's another, it's another example of uh, our city council coming up with an incomplete program. They didn't really even look at how the uh, courts would process the appeals procedure. They probably didn't even talk to the circuit clerk because uh, that was one of the problems that came up with early on. I think we need to look at these programs and um, come up with more complete solutions for them. If, it, um, if it's about safety, then that's a good thing. You know, we shouldn't be running red lights. But um, I've been looking at, like, uh, Kennedy City's had some problems with recently because they have to come up with their appeals process and I think they have 60 days to um, to make to uh, to get that appeals process in place in order for them to operate their their uh, traffic cameras and I think it's a very expensive program I mean I'm looking into what the cost is as opposed to what we're bringing in and I think it's a very incomplete program it's something they shouldn't have jumped in before they had everything all T's crossed and the I's dotted and that's one thing I would be looking at I'd be looking at the complete program before I jump in thank you for something days. like this I think this is one thing we all agree on. I would vote to end the red light cameras. And as for where I'd find the other two and a half million dollars, I'd have to look at the budget to figure that out. But I can write a grant to find two and a half million dollars if I need to. So uh, that's what I do. Thank you. Next question is for Mr. Dunsing. It's a couple parts, so I'll read them again if you guys need me to. How long have you lived in the district you're running in? And do you own a home there? And then what life experience drove you to enter the race? I've lived in my house uh, for about five years, and I rent it. And uh, it, was, it, was, it, was an edu it was about education. It was really changing people's lives in education, going around and um, helping, being a helper to, to students that I, is an experience that I want to do for you. I want to be your servant. I want to be your helper. Thank you. Okay. My wife and I uh, moved into our current house in the Central Oak Park neighborhood about five years ago. And uh, we have two children and uh, two dogs and a cat. Um, if only they could vote, you know, that would help. <laughs> but anyway, um, one of the things that drove me to um, decide to run for the election is um, twofold. Basically, uh, Jeff Danner had term limits, so he's not, he's out, you know, out of the race. The other um, thing is that um, if you read the, the uh, Tom, Tampa Bay Times article, it kind of gave a good synopsis of why I got in. 
about three years ago, I started looking at what the city council was doing. And um, they wanted to increase their revenue, and they wanted to uh, bring in those businesses that were um, going out to Ybor City late at night. So they extended the hours for the closing from 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. And I know from the studies that I've looked at over the years that if you're going to increase that time, you're going to increase the amount of problems that you're going to have. The nuisance crimes that you have, like DUIs, are going to go up on the, on the rise. You're going to have fights. Recently, we had a... Um, Thank you, Mr. Davis. I got oh. a picture short. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. If you want a, a more complete answer, I'll talk to me later. Thank you. I lived in St. Petersburg for approximately 12 years. I previously owned a home. I don't currently because it doesn't fit with my lifestyle. That's very busy. And the life experience that um, caused me to choose to... Uh, jump into this race is twofold. Uh, I currently, again, work to encourage girls to pursue non-traditional careers, and I felt like it was really important to lead by example. And then secondly, it was really about experience. Um, I watched city council for the last couple of years as they made decisions and felt like they were making decisions based on just their districts and without a really a systemic plan to change the entire city and what was needed um, as a full plan for our city. And I felt like my consensus building skills and collaboration skills would be really helpful in that area. I've lived in St. Petersburg for 10 years, and between my wife and I, we own four homes. We started off with one, and uh, I spent years rebuilding this house. About the time I got done, the economy kind of tanked, and our neighborhood really got ugly. We ended up with seven empty houses on our block. Over a period of a couple of years, we bought three of them, and I've completely restored them. I've got great families living in, in them now, and I just want to take this commitment to the city, citywide. You know, I love living here, and this kind of activity is contagious, and everybody wants to live in a nice, safe neighborhood. Thanks. Davis, this is your question. What steps would you take to lure business to St. Pete? And what types of businesses would you like to see open a new shop or relocate here? One minute. Okay. Uh, one minute. I will keep to that. <laughs> um, basically, um, some of the uh, things I'd like to do to lure businesses into the area is to support our local education system. Uh, that's one of the things the polls look at. You look at the, um, the, the companies that want to move here, they want a good, strong education system. And as a former teacher, I, I believe in supporting the teachers any way we can, uh, whether it's uh, giving them print cartridges so they can make more copies if the state doesn't fund them adequately. And things like that, you know, help your teachers, support those teachers because they're the ones that are educating your, your students, your children, and they make a big difference in our community. That's the biggest thing I would look for, support education. Thank you. I think we need to build on our strengths. What's most important is that we bring higher wage jobs to our community. Our housing um, is currently increasing at 10% and our income is not uh, growing with the same pace. So it's really important that we look at tech and innovation startups, financial service businesses, things like that. Some of the ways I think that we can do that, uh, we might have to provide some incentives, but we need to expand our economic development programs. We're not spending enough money in that area to attract businesses and to really sell the strengths of our city. I think it's important we, we invite the right kind of companies and businesses to be here in St. Petersburg. Um, I'd like to work with our Chamber of Commerce, perhaps use them as a, uh, as a lobbying firm for our city to help draw some new businesses in here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've got a, my pet project at 22nd Avenue North to build some more retail there. Uh, our new CRA of the 34th Street Corridor, I think, will has, has a tremendous potential to build a lot of businesses and, and really change the makeup of that central corridor of St. Petersburg. Thanks. Good green jobs uh, is the kinds of jobs I'd like to bring. Uh, one, to do that, I think we really need to work on our public transportation. Uh, people are not going to want to have businesses here if their employees can't get to work. 
Uh, the other thing is, once again, uh, my approach is, is networking, networking, networking. I will, I'll go out and I'll find out who people know, who people are, might have a business to bring down here, and I'll, and I'll call them personally. I'll say, come on down to St. Pete. We have a great art scene. We have a great urban agriculture scene. We have great community going on here. Come on down. This is a great place. Not so much we have great beaches. So uh, come, come on down. Thank you. This has come up a little bit, a lot of questions about it. What's your position on curbside recycling and would you try to implement it full time in St. Pete? Why, why not? I think it's important that we have recycling. It goes along with our Green City program. I know that a lot of voters that I've talked to would like it to be a single stream program. Um, and I think we need to do some more exploration and see what the return on investment can be um, to make sure that uh, the um, that the, the we can make money off of a lot of people are saying that they don't want to pay the three dollars but we can make money off of what happens whenever you recycle those waste materials so that's what I'd like us to look more into well, I did mention this earlier I think that it's important that the city take over the recycling uh, for the same reason she said you know there's value in the plastics and the glass and the newspapers and I think that the value of those raw materials could help offset the cost of the collection. So I think it's something that the, shit, this is, that the city should be handling versus outsourcing it. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think we should ultimately work towards uh, recycling, uh, universal curbside recycling, although it's important to note that one, um, we do have universal recycling of, of a room of cans here in the city. You just put them out and say free cans, they will be gone. Um, I think we need to look at some al al alternative methodologies of, of getting things recycled. Um, you know, one of the things I think we can do is put on bumper stickers on the, on the, on the, on the dumpsters that say use free recycle. You got something useful, just bring it to a thrift store. Um, the other thing is, I, I, at Pride Parade, I was amazed there was someone who makes flooring using recycled um, plastic bottles. So there's, there's a lot of ways that we can reuse the waste. Thank you. I always support uh, curbside recycling. Um, the current program that the uh, mayor implemented is working fairly well. But uh, what I'm disturbed by is the lack of other people that have joined on board uh, in my neighborhood. <laughs> There is very few, very sparsely things. So I would like to talk to more neighbors and find out what it is that they're looking for, so we can match up, you know, their wants and desires with what we can do. I think there wasn't enough of that done initially to find out what it is. Everybody's unique. Um, also, I looked at look at our model programs, like the one in Sarasota has been operating for years, and they do a really good job. I'd like to see some dumpsters, maybe that people could bring their recyclables to, maybe more of them. You know than we already have. That's those are the things that I'd be looking at. Thank you very much. And that was the last question that we're going to ask of our candidates. I'm going to do something I had planned on. I'm going to give each of the candidates one minute as their final uh, push. Mr. Galvin, if you'd like to start, you get one minute of closing remarks. Oh, so no question. No sir. Okay. The reason I'm running is my experience. I have a long background in building, and that's a big part of what city council deals with. And with Jeff Danner terming out, there won't be anybody left on city council who has the experience and a background in construction and building. I've been a member of St. Pete Preservation for six years. Uh, I've restored a, an 86-year-old home and three other homes already here in the neighborhood. And I think it's important that somebody on council has those skills. So that's a unique background that I bring to it, plus my years as a small business owner. Um, I think I'm the right person for this job. Thank you. I started off tonight by saying that I ran for city council because I have the skills we need to meet our city's goals. And so I just will follow up with talking a little bit about that. You, we need someone with the skills to bring people together and build consensus and move us forward. And um, I think what Mr. Galvin said is important, but Mr. Danner has endorsed myself, and so I, I think that that is not as important as some of the other skills that are needed in order to move the city forward. Thank you. 
I'll keep it to a minute. I want you to, um, when you go to the polls and you're looking at the candidates, look at the amount of government experience that the um, individuals have. This is briefly summarized. I've had seven years working with the city of St. Pete. I was union steward. Um, five years before that, I worked for the state of Florida in another very successful program, the WIC program. Uh, previous to that, I had a bachelor's of arts in uh, political science from Drake University. I've been studying a lot of these issues. And I would bring to you more complete solutions to our problems. Every day I go out there and I talk to somebody and maybe help them get their, their back alley repaved or exotic birds removed. There's some issues that come up day to day as a city councilman that you um, that are not as uh, exotic and flamboyant as the lens or the rays, you know, the drama surrounding those issues. Day to day you have city services that you want to see provided, and I think I can deliver on those those issues for you today. Thank you, Mr. Davis. I think you know that I am here because I appreciate you, and I want to serve you, and I, I want to thank you all for coming out here in the rain, and that's all. I, I'll end on some, some bit of Shakespeare. A long time ago the world begun with a hey oh the wind and the rain. But that's all what my speech is done, and I'll aim to please you every day. Jimmy? Mike's going to check, sorry. Continue on. These are the Democratic candidates for the position of mayor for St. Petersburg. I'm going to give each of you guys uh, five minutes for your opening remarks. Please keep them to five minutes. Jesse is our timer, so if you think you're getting a little long with it, just glance down to Jesse. And if he's doing this, you know that you've reached your limit. Well, let's try to keep it to five. Let's try to keep it to five. Fair to everybody involved. So, if you'd like to go first, Mr. Kajimi, please. I raise the Bible because I place God before money, man, and government. A short reading from the book of Leviticus, the Old Testament. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. If a man lies with a male as if he were a woman, both men have committed an offense, something perverse, unnatural, abhorrent, 
and detestable. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. This is the word of God. Good evening. My name is Paul Congemi, and I am a candidate for mayor of St. Petersburg. I am not accustomed to wearing a suit, and I am not accustomed to wearing a tie, but I am accustomed to telling the truth. I represent God, morality, and the common man. This is far, far from a perfect world. I am not the perfect man. But yet I have been called by God to a perfect mission. My mission is to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to house the homeless, to provide jobs to the jobless, and to choose the human race over the nuclear race. Over the last four years, the Foster Administration and City Council members has made life more miserable for the common man and for the poor. Its attitude has been contemptuous. Its policies and programs have been unfair to the working people and they must be held accountable for their actions. I am not in this race to talk about lining my pockets full of money. I want everyone in this room to know that it is not about money. I am in this race to talk about the common working people and to make sure that they are treated fairly. The St. Petersburg City sanitation workers are the lowest paid workers in the city. The Parks Department workers are also the lowest paid. I will fight to make sure that they earn the same salary as police officers. It's only fair. I am not in this race to talk about greed, dollars and cents, and big business and industry. And I will never put greed big business and industry in dollars and cents before the common man. I am not in this big race to talk about the building a new $50 million pier. And I am not in this race to talk about the possibility of building a billion dollar baseball stadium. I'm not here to talk about greed, dollars and cents when we have working class people who earn minimum wage and cannot afford to be hospitalized if they get sick because they cannot afford to have medical insurance. Let me make this perfectly clear. These are the people that I represent. I represent the working poor, the people who earn minimum wage, and I represent those with no medical insurance. If elected mayor of this great city, I plan to host benefits to raise money to build a charity hospital for those with no medical insurance and for the poor. I have a very special message for the poor and for the, for the young people who live in the poorest neighborhoods in our city of St. Petersburg. I challenge them to put hope in their brain and not dope in their vein. Young America, Dream. Dream of a new value system. Choose the human race over the nuclear race. Bury the weapons that don't burn people. Dream of a new value system. Teachers who teach for life and not just for a living. Dream of lawyers more concerned about justice than a judgeship. Dream of doctors more concerned about public health than personal wealth. Thank you, Mr. Kajimi. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> nice to see so many friendly faces out here tonight. Many of you know me, thank you, many of you know me from my time on city council or from the six years I spent fighting for common sense in the Florida legislature. 
But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rick Kreisman. I grew up in West St. Petersburg, went to Bogusiega High School and the University of Florida, and came back home to attend Stetson University College of Law. I've been married to my wife, Carrie, now for 20 years, and we have two kids, my daughter, Jordan, who's here with me tonight, and my son, Samuel. Uh, my daughter, Jordan, just finished her freshman year of high school at St. Pete High in the IB program, which means that uh, she's three years away from college uh, and three years from watching her father cry. <laughs> um, my family's really the main reason that I decided not to run for re-election to the legislature. While it was your voice, or my honor to be your voice in the Capitol to pass some good legislation and to, to fight bad legislation and try and slow down Rick Scott's agenda, there was something that was missing back home here. And again, while I did come home to be with my family, one of the things that I missed while serving in the legislature was a place where ideas and policy mattered more than partisanship. And that's what local government is all about, especially here in St. Peter. And I served with Mayor Rick Baker for six years. He's a Republican, I'm a Democrat. Even worse, he's FSU and I'm UF. <laughs> but, there, but on the things that, that have nothing to do with our love of the city, we were unified in, in our concept and our idea to move this city forward. Because that's the way it should be. And that's what you deserve. And that's why I'm running for mayor. It's about moving this city forward. It's time that we resolve the big issues like the pier and Tampa Bay Rays baseball team, but it's also time that we pay attention to all the other issues that make cities great. An economic engine that's powered by a strong public education, sound infrastructure, and a high quality of life. These are the keys to reaching our full potential. That economic engine must always include our locally owned small businesses which not only provide good paying jobs for our community, but they also add to the character of our community. Now many of these issues can only be addressed by changing course, and change begins within. To me, the job of mayor isn't simply to maintain the status quo. It isn't to point out what's not working in the city. It's to be a problem solver. It's to be innovative and proactive. It's to be a unifier. It's to listen to learn, and to lead. Under my administration, nowhere will this be more visible than within City Hall. My goal is a smarter government, not a bigger one. It's a government that reflects the demographics of our community, that it serves and it empowers every individual. I'm not running for mayor because I want to shake up City Hall. I'm running to prepare us for the future. St. Petersburg's an extraordinary place. It's been that way since the first train arrived on the Orange Belt Railway 125 years ago. An extraordinary city with extraordinary people deserve the best government possible. It's my intent, with your help, to provide that. And I know I have a few minutes left to address, I guess, the couple questions. I'm sure we'll, we'll answer these in the question and answer. I've made my position on the pier very clear. Uh, I do not support the lens, but. Leadership isn't just about opposing things, it's about talking about how we solve the problems and move forward, and that's why when I came out saying I opposed the lens, I provided a plan for moving us forward to try and have a new structure built by 2015. Regarding the raise, my job as mayor will, do, will be to, to, to do everything I can to keep that team here, respecting the, the, the money that we as taxpayers have invested in that team, but even more so, respecting the people who gave up their homes and businesses for that stadium to be built. Uh, if that team is intent on moving, it's my job to make sure that I protect the taxpayers and get every single dollar we can from them and we try and keep them in the region. As far as efficiencies in city services, the best way to improve city services, increase city services, is to have the resources to do that. You do that by creating jobs and increasing the tax base. And I have a plan for how we do that and bring more jobs to this community. And I'm sure I'll get an opportunity to talk a little bit more about that. And lastly, how does my campaign win? We have a better message that we're going to be presenting to people. Uh, I have a better field organization and grassroots. We are going to knock on more doors, call more people, uh, and shake hands and personally meet more people. Uh, and we're going to have the revenue and the, the resources to do what we need to do uh, to get our message out to the people and tell them why this city of St. Petersburg deserves leadership, 
The city of St. Petersburg deserves someone who will bring us together and unify us as a community and that can solve problems. And I'm that guy. And I look forward to your vote on August 27th. Thank you. about it. What steps would you take to lure businesses to St. Pete? And what types of businesses would you like to see open a new shop or relocate here? One minute, please. Yeah, and this, this is a tough question in a minute, but I'll be as quick as I can. First off, we're not taking advantage of the natural partnerships that we should be having in marine sciences with USF St. Petersburg uh, and in our medical community with All Children's and John Hopkins. I think we have tremendous opportunity there. We also, I would like to have somebody that works for the city whose sole duty is not only to green our city and to make sure we're doing everything to become a greener city, but is looking to bring green businesses to St. Petersburg, whether it's solar, LED, battery power. We have tremendous opportunity. We're not taking advantage of it. And we have the Dome Industrial Park that we ought to be looking for small businesses instead of waiting for that big 500 employer business. I believe that the common man is not treated fairly. As far as businesses coming to this area, uh, it, you know, we're talking about greed, dollars and cents, and big business and industry. I prefer God over government. I have a simple, simple answer to this question: God over government. Mr. Presiding, the next question is for you, sir. <laughs> Do you support renewable fuel production in St. Pete? And will you support future initiatives which focus on local energy production? I must be honest with you about this question. I don't know much about it. So I'm going to just give it to Mr. Kreisman. I, I don't know anything about that. Mr. Kreisman? Yes, I do. This is a question from the crowd. Jable Circuit announced today they may have to move their 2,000 workers to the TIF area near Tropicana, TIF area near Tropicana Field. What would you see as the pluses and negatives to that? Uh, and I had not heard that yet uh, today. Um, you know, one of the things that, that always concerns me that Tallahassee has done, and, and I think the city of St. Petersburg has also done, is uh, it's, it's, it's fine to give tax uh, benefits and incentives to businesses uh, but we don't hold them accountable uh, for making sure that they are producing what they what they are talking about producing when it comes to employees or the way their the salaries that they're paying. Uh, so I'd want to look at that deal very carefully. Uh, certainly, Jable is an important employer, and I'd like to see him stay in the city. Uh, but I also want him to do whatever it is that, that the deal that they got that they said they were going to do. Jable Circuit announced today they may have to move their 2,000 workers to the TIF area near Tropicana Field. What do you see as the pluses and minus and negatives to that? Okay. Why do they have to move their business to, to another location? Why? I mean, is it greed? They want to, you know. Yes. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I mean, uh, they've always been a very popular, uh, you know, place for people to be employed. I just, I just, I, I've never heard of this today. It's the first thing I've time, time I've heard of it tonight. I, I really don't know the answer to this. Okay. I must be honest with we'll you. We'll move on to the next question, Vince, for you. What would you do to reduce flooding in our streets? Okay, I, I believe that this, I've been living in the city for 44 years, and first of all, I have no respect for the people who work for the roads department. Uh, I mean, I tried to get an alleyway paved in the back of my condominium a while back, and they said they were going to do it, and they never did it. Um, you need to replace these people that that don't get the job done. That's, that's really what you need to do, and, and, and replace them with people who are more dedicated, you know, 
get the floods out of the street. Thank you. Well, there's a couple issues that, that, uh, that we can do, a couple things we can do to address uh, flooding. First off, uh, we do have an aging infrastructure. Uh, so we really need to take a look at our infrastructure uh, and in those areas that we do need to do some replacement projects. <clears throat> Aside from the fact that it's going to hopefully help with flooding, it also is going to put people back to work. But the second thing that we ought to be looking at is backflow uh, prevention devices. I know that in um, uh, the area where Mayor Foster lives, they've had some issues consistently with, with flooding and backflow prevention devices uh, have, have assisted and reduced some of the flooding in those areas. But uh, let's, let's face it, climate change is an issue we've got to deal with uh, and we really need to have a long term plan. What is your position on red light cameras? If you would get rid of them, where would you try to make up their portion of the 2.5 million budget for traffic and parking funds? Well, this is, a, this is an issue that I've been dealing with uh, since I was on city council, actually, when I was chair of public safety and infrastructure when we started looking at red light cameras. And uh, I know what the, the popular answer is, is uh, and, and that's to say I'd do away with them, but I looked at them from the standpoint of safety. Uh, I'm a personal injury lawyer uh, by trade, and I've seen too many people who've been in T-bone accidents. Uh, and I have a daughter now who is, who is driving. And the idea of somebody running a red light and, and hitting her scares the scares me. Um, the bottom line is the technology needs to be right. Uh, if we're doing it, we need to be doing it for one reason and one reason only, and it isn't revenue, it's safety. We need to be changing people's behaviors. Uh, so I want to look at the technology. I have some issues with right turns on red. Those give me concerns over the arbitrary nature of them. Uh, and I think I, I would absolutely look at the system that we're running to make sure we're doing it right and take out uh, any question about uh, technology from the, the equation. Thank you. Yes, sir, same question. You know, people have been driving cars for 100 years. I mean, why do we need this now? I mean, what we need, instead of having, you know, these cameras, we need more responsible drivers, people behind the wheel. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a waste of money, and uh, we, we could put our money towards something more more important to help the common man. Yes, sir, could you have any next questions for you, sir? What is your position on curbside recycling, and would you try to implement it in St. Pete full time? This was an issue uh, four years ago. Uh, we. Uh, they talked about it when I was running for mayor then. Uh, frankly, to be honest with you, I don't know much about it. <laughs> I, I'm being honest with you. When I, when I don't know something about something, I, I have to overlook it. <laughs> I don't know much about it. Thank you, sir. Uh, the answer to that is yes, I do support universal curbside recycling. I think it's uh, pretty amazing that we are designated as a green city and yet we're one of the few cities in the state that doesn't have it. Uh, and as the fourth largest city in the state, it certainly is something that we should be doing. Uh, so yeah, the answer is yes. The next question is a public safety question. And just looking for your opinion. Are you in favor of uniformed and or gun carrying officers in our public schools? Yeah, you know, I know there's a big movement, and it was one of the things that I, that concerned me the most uh, from my time in the legislature was the expansion of, uh, of guns in, in pretty much everywhere, it seemed like, with, uh, with um, the legislature. I, I have some real concerns about uh, expanding uh, public safety officers, the number of officers and weapons. Um, I think we need to work really closely with the school system in trying to create environments that are safe for our kids. Uh, I think there are other ways of creating those safe environments than simply adding more officers uh, who are uh, carrying weapons. Uh, I'd like to see us change the environment and create a safer atmosphere, a teaching atmosphere where our teachers can actually teach. Well, 
it's very unfortunate that we're living in a society where anybody can get a hold of guns or you know, not right in the head. And, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm in favor of uh, having more armed officers in school. It's for the safety of the kids. And, uh, I don't. I, I think it's a. It's a plus. I'm favor. I'm in favor of. Next question, sir. What would you do about the issues of drugs, gangs, and the future of our youth and the safety of our citizens? Well, first of all. I have had an issue with the police department for years, uh, <laughs> as far as drugs are concerned. Uh, along 34th Street North and 34th Street South, we have a string of motels that have been there for 60 years. These are the prostitute motels and narcotics dealers are in there. They live there. They work out of those places. Um, the reason why this activity continues the reason why this activity continues year after year, this narcotics, this illegal drug dealing out of these motels, I believe it's because somebody at the top is getting their palms greased. I believe that there is corruption at the highest levels of law enforcement, and that's why this continues to go on. We need a change in law enforcement. We need a new chief of police. We need a new vice and narcotics division of the St. Petersburg Police Department. Thank you, Mr. Kajimi. Well, the simplest way that you fight crime in, in, in ju with juveniles is you improve education and you uh, open, uh, create job opportunities. <coughs> Our education system, as is, is we've talked about previously and is it, St. Petersburg needs to have the best schools not only in Pinellas County but in the state and the city has opportunities that we haven't taken advantage of to partner uh, our previous mayor did a much better job than Mayor Foster has in that respect uh, but you have to have jobs available too and you've got to bring jobs to this community there needs to be summer job programs again uh, so that kids can not only uh, earn some additional money but they gain some, some self-respect and they start building their resumes. So I, I think we look at jobs, we look at summer job programs, and we look at education. If we do those things well, we divert kids away from crime and we send them in a, a much better direction. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, thank you all for coming out on this uh, treacherous evening. Uh, one of, it seems like, many. Hopefully tomorrow night we'll have a nice 4th of July. But I, I appreciate you all being here. This is an important election. I, you're probably used to hearing that. It seems like every election we hear someone say, this is the most important election ever. But in St. Petersburg, this is we're kind of at a turning point. Uh, we had a tremendous leadership uh, over a period of time where we saw really some significant growth going on in this community. And then we kind of came to a stop. And for the last several years, nothing's been happening. Um, there hasn't been any leadership to move us forward. Our community has become more divided, and we're not addressing the issues that we really need to be addressing from education and uh, jobs and public safety, but also neighborhoods. There wasn't a lot of conversation tonight about neighborhoods and strengthening our neighborhood associations and putting money back into neighborhood partnership grants because the neighborhoods is really what made our community um, so special. It's what we were known as, as a community of neighborhoods. We have a lot of challenges ahead of us, but it, it really excites me uh, to know what we can do and the possibilities that we can not only be the fourth largest city in the state, but we can become the most vibrant uh, city in the state with that, that's known around the country for our culture and our arts and our education programs. We've already got a great basis with our four universities that we've got in town. Uh, and we can build on that. I'm very excited about the future of this community. I look forward to leading us forward, to working together to build this community and make it stronger, uh, and uh, working to, to uh, bring equality to all areas of the city and not just focused on downtown. So I look forward to your vote on August 27th. Thank you so much. city for 44 years and I have seen mayor after mayor 
after city councilman, after city councilman, come and go. And all they talk about is greed, dollars and cents, and big business and industry. They don't talk about the common man. Uh, the St. Petersburg sanitation workers, the, the parks department workers, uh, they haven't had a, a, a raise in, in eight years in, in their pay. Now, just yesterday I read in the paper the mayor is giving 2% raise to the city employees. Big deal. City council members and the mayor gave themselves a raise twice in the last eight years. This, it's not fair to the common working people. I will never put greed, dollars and cents, and big business and industry before the common man. On behalf of the St. Pete Democratic Club, I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. For those of you who want to uh, mingle with uh, Mr. Kreisman, you can do so up here towards the front of the stage. And if you want to mingle with uh, Mr. Kinjemi, um, we'll put his camp towards the rear of the auditorium. That way there's no backlog for the city council candidates. I think they're already out in the lobby, so feel free to mingle with them. And I also want to invite everybody to the St. Pete Democrats next meeting, which is going to be Wednesday, August 7th, and we meet at the Hill on First Street South, Wednesday, August 7th. 7 p.m. Thank you.